Hey, Patrick Coffin here, basking in the afterglow of the uh, carb coma induced state after Thanksgiving. I want to talk for a few minutes about apologetics for teens and the specific challenges that teens represent with regard to sharing the Catholic faith. I taught high school. I love that age. I have two teenage daughters myself and I understand that that teens come with certain challenges that they're not insurmountable, but they're important things to keep in mind when you're sharing the faith with our teenage brethren. Uh, this is the era that C.S. Lewis called the dark ages of every human life. And the first thing I want to mention is that teens have what my late dad, Jack, called the three eyes. They feel that they're invincible, infallible, and immortal. They look at their life as a, a you know, a, a series of uh, unlimited meadows, just the you know, sky's the limit, which is great. It enables young people to dream big. Um, on the other hand, they live as though tomorrow's owed to them. And sometimes it takes a, a, cr a crisis or a trial or a knock in life to dislodge or to kind of shatter the image of the three eyes. And, but sometimes God's grace can work sovereignly, as we know. There are a lot of teenage saints. Think about St. Maria Goretti, who was 11 years old. So bring to mind an 11-year-old you know. And Maria's sanctity began even in early childhood. It's not that she became a saint the day that she was knifed to death by her would-be murderer, Alessandro Serenelli. No, that was the fruit, the culmination of a lifelong, sh short as it was, uh, union with Christ. Saint Teresa of Lisieux reached the heights of sanctity before she was uh, diagnosed with uh, tuberculosis. She died when she was 24, but she was already on that journey towards sanctity when she was a teenager. Uh, some of the Cristero War warriors in Mexico reached the heights of sanctity while they were teenagers. Blessed uh, Chiara Luce Badano, who died in 1990 at the age of 18 of osteosarcoma. She's a great uh, intercessor and model of, for normal teenage sanctity. The other thing that teens tend to fall into rather easily is indifferentism. You know, you tell a teen that he or she is apathetic and they say, who cares? They have this sort of meh indifferentism. And that can be hard to overcome. You have to find a way to make the Christian faith striking, unusual, offbeat, unexpected, awesome. Teens love awesome. The whole concept is very it resonates with uh, with most teens, in my experience. Uh, teens also have a a frustrating ability to ask amazingly deep questions. They really have a handle on philosophical issues, in the main but they don't always have the mental capacity to accept the answer, to grasp and receive the thing they're asking about, whether it's the existence of evil or the problem of, you know, suffering of innocence, uh, the apparent victory of science over faith, which is a big thing they're going to run into in, in college. Um, so along with that comes the, the malleability of teenagers. Teenagers are very prone to peer pressure. Now, this is not a bad thing, and it's not necessarily a good thing. It's just a thing. It's a fact. Jim Rohn, and I never tire of saying this, Jim Rohn said that we are the average of the five people we spend the most time with. If your teens are surrounded by five really solid teens who love Christ and want to make him better loved, if they're really living a life of virtue in their teen years, then that's going to influence your teen. Or if you're a teenager, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you uh, hang out with people who are lazy, who are full of selfishness, and they have bad habits, guess what? Those bad habits rub off on you. So peer pressure is morally neutral. It depends on what you're being pressured or influenced to do and to become 